Uh, the meeting is now being recorded. Uh, we have 83 people registered. Uh, most of them are from Europe, but we also have some from the US and also one from Canada. So each presenter will have 15 minutes to present. Uh, we'll also have five minutes for questions. And I've asked of the presenters uh, if we can't address every question in the five minutes remaining, uh, whether they're prepared to take those questions by email. They've all graciously agreed to that. So if you have a question, uh, please don't think it will take up too much time. Do ask it in the chat box, and there'll be an opportunity for the presenters to address that question. Earlier in trying to set up, we did have a few technical problems uh, uploading presentations. So uh, the presenters will be sharing their screens. So do bear with us as uh, that those connections come through. So let me start now by introducing Fabio Nascimbini uh, from Universidad Internacional de Rioja uh, in Rome. His presentation is Building Critical Digital Literacy for Higher Education Teachers, the EDUHACK Approach. Uh, so Fabio is a senior fellow of the European Distance and E-Learning Network. He's a member of the advisory board of the Open Education Working Group of the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation. He's a fellow at the Centro de Estudos Sobre Tecnologia e Sociedade, which I have not pronounced well, of the University of Sao Paulo and USP in Brazil. And he's also at the Nexus Center of the Politecnico di Torino. He's been active in the field of learning innovation and ICT for learning since 1998 uh, by designing and coordinating more than 40 research and innovation projects and promoting European and international collaboration in different areas, from school education to higher education, to lifelong learning, to ICT research. He's been working across Europe as well as in Latin America, the Caribbean, the South Mediterranean, and Southeast Asia. His main research interests are open education, learning innovation, digital literacy, social and digital inclusion. So Fabio, it's wonderful to have you with us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, first question: Can you see my PowerPoint? I'm sharing the screen. It should be working. Okay, good. Right, and I guess you can hear me well. Perfect. So, uh, I will try to be quick to allow time for for questions and also for a little debate. In case I would like to hear also the opinion of my of my fellow speakers on what I'm going to present. What that basically is a new approach uh, to, uh, I would say, digital competencies building and digital literacy building for uh, university teachers in Europe. Uh, you know, and many people come with new approaches. Uh, it's hard to say what is really new and what is a repetition of what was new yesterday. But let's say in uh, with this uh, with this uh, work we are doing in collaboration with a number of, of colleagues uh, around Europe, we are trying to. Uh, hack the way, and that's why the, 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 the project is called EduHack. We are trying to hack, so to uh, try to change from within the way uh, university professors, especially at the beginning of their career, are trained as far as uh, digital competence is uh, concerned. Uh, you might be familiar with these uh, or similar frameworks, uh, these nice pictures which try to simplify the complexity that comes with uh, being today a digital competent citizen, uh, learner, and even more difficult digital competent uh, teacher. And especially uh, what is, I think, the most interesting one for our work is the one on the bottom right, is the uh, Digicomp Edu framework by the European Commission, by the Joint Research Center in Seville, from which we started uh, for, for this work. Uh, basically, you can see that in that uh, candy uh, shape of the, of, the, of the framework, we took the central part, so the center of the candy, the, actually the, the four areas uh, of the candy, to sort of uh, operationalize them. Because in fact, uh, by reading literature and by talking to people in charge of, uh, of uh, developing uh, digital competences of teachers, uh, people like, like you, Mark, uh, in, in your university and others, actually the, the, the big problem is how to make uh, operational these frameworks, which are very nice and uh, take normally everything into account. Uh, sometimes they are not critical enough, uh, sometimes they are very broad, sometimes they are they have, a, they have a very specific viewpoint, but still, the issue is how to make them work in practice and how to make sure that uh, the competences that they say, the Commission, for example, the European Commission, that every teacher should have are actually uh, acquired by, by teachers. And so we came up with this idea of this EduHack uh, project that you can see the, the, the site, eduhack.eu. 
And basically, this, uh, this work will, uh, will uh, come up uh, with a capacity building program for university educators who wish to, de to develop skills and knowledge uh, that at the end of the day, uh, I, I, that at the end of the day should be able to, uh, let's say, create or, or produce or support technology enhanced learning experience for their for for their learners i'm not opening up the full screen because i did it before and adobe was collapsing so i'm keeping it like like that i hope you can read it uh, so there you can see uh, who we are so it's uh, us from unir in spain it's the polytechnic of torino in italy it's the knowledge innovation center in malta at it in belgium and the coventry colleagues at coventry university disruptive media learning lab and basically, what we propose is an approach that has four uh, features. First of all, it is open. So everything we are doing is not only, and, and we are producing, is not only open in terms of license, but is actually sending people out on the open web to look for stuff, to look for uh, content, and uh, to try to experience what it means to live today in open and participatory web-based society for the students and uh, so uh, for the teachers. Then uh, the approach is collaborative by definition. In every activity, we, we try to, to foster work with peers and if possible co-creation also with students, you will see in a moment. It is active. So the, the three key words for every activity we propose are uh, read, watch, and do. And as you will see, read and watch are very fast, very, very quick, whilst the do is what we are really keen on. So it is an active, uh, very active approach. And uh, we are not uh, focusing only on, of course, on um, digital literacy in the classic sense, in being able to meaningfully use the, the um, let's say, online tools and digital tools, but also we try to focus on new literacies and delicate issues like online identity management, uh, personal data uh, management, intercultural competences, uh, ethical issues and privacy issues. So we try to touch upon these, uh, these uh, issues. Basically, we have an online course. I will show it to you in a moment with a number of, activity, of activities from which participants can choose from. Then um, in every one of the three universities that are part of the, of the project, you will run a, a hackathon with the teachers who have been taking the course and who, who will experiment in real, li in real life with some experts to support them. What it means to, to to create an OER, for example, to create an open book, to develop an open assessment strategy, and so on and so forth. And everything they will produce through the hackathons, and also before, but let's say mainly through the hackathons, will be documented and connected through a, what we call a semantic platform. Let's say it's a sort of a, basically, a very simple platform where all the posts from the blogs of the teachers and the, the products of the hackathons will be shared, commentable, votable, and should represent a sort of a growing um, knowledge base uh, around the, the project. So basically so, the online course, which is about to get uh, uh, public now, I, will, uh, I can show it to you in a moment, but basically we are talking about uh, a, a self-directed course uh, uh, based on four areas uh, from which uh, the learner can focus with some 20 activities. So. The, the, the learner is able to really select uh, the ones he or she prefers. Each activity takes about one hour to complete, so it's not, uh, as you can see, a lot of work. Most of the activities have to do with specific tools that we are explaining how they work, we're explaining how to use them in, uh, in, uh, in, in higher education settings and, and why they should be used with some examples and then we bring to the tool. Uh, again, for every activity, we have a read, watch, do logic. So you, you, you read something pretty short, you watch a couple of videos, and then you work on the, on, the, on the task, on the assignment. Ideally, the output will be an open portfolio. So every, every learner is provided with a simple blog or uh, can use his or her, or her own blog to, to do the work. And of course, you can both take the course by yourself or as a part of the cohort in view of, uh, of the hackathon. This is how the course page works. So you can see you have a, a read page, very short. You have a couple of videos and you have a, a very simple activity. In this case, even shorter than one hour and then some additional resources. Let me just, since I'm using the, the, 
the share screen, I can show you how the course looks now. You can see it's still under internal evaluation, but it's pretty simple. You have all the activities. You can just select one activity and you will you will get here. In this case, it's about modifying, modifying existing digital content by using wikis. So you read why this is important. You watch some examples on how to do this. And in one hour, in this case, you play the Wikipedia adventure. So it's some, uh, you spend an hour on Wikipedia doing a number of things uh, and, and that's it. And then of course, for every activity, you should reflect on your blog on how this could be used in your teaching and why this was important for you and so on and so forth. Then you're gonna have the hackathons, one in Madrid, one in Torino and one in Coventry. Uh, each university is different in our case, but also outside the consortium and uh, every hackathon will differ from the others. Some ones will be smaller, more open, more closed, open to other universities also. Some will have a stronger online part, some will not. And so everyone will be an event, but what they will have in common, a separate event, but what they will have in common is the fact that teachers will come in with an idea developed and inspired through the online course and will work for at least one full day, if not more, in order to develop this idea and to come up with either a plan for a MOOC or a, an open resource or some um, a plan or, or a strategy to use some specific tools. By the way, we are already uh, getting uh, expressions of interest by a number of universities. I'm now quoting by heart uh, the University of Luxembourg we are talking to, the University of Pavia in Italy, the University of uh, uh, Torino also in Italy, the other university in Torino and a few more, and uh, the London uh, Banking and Finance Institute and a few more who basically like the idea of having a very light course and then meeting for one day or more uh, uh, with the professors to really work uh, in practice on, on how to change their even a small piece of their teaching. And by changing the small piece in, a, in an open, collaborative and active way, the, the hope is that they will see that uh, things can be can be done differently. Very quickly, this is uh, these are the activities in terms of uh, digital resources. Uh, so just uh, have a quick look at it. Uh, we tried uh, to be uh, as uh, basic as possible, but uh, as uh, as inspiring also as possible. So we try to touch upon very easy things uh, that can be done in uh, in one hour time and that can change. Uh, uh, a bit something uh, that can produce a minimal change actually in the in the mindset of the teacher in the in the cultural uh, way teachers are are approaching uh, digital uh, tools in the in the class so you can see there we touch upon assessment content uh, pedagogy and the, the four area empowering learners which is possibly the more delicate one it has to do with evaluating online tools discovering the cost of free social media platforms, uh, appreciating risks of personalization in learning, and dealing with uh, technical accessibility of platforms and resources. For each one of these, for example, activities, we are proposing a tool that the teachers can use also in the classroom with their students, regardless of their field. Actually, you can teach anything, but you must know that when your students are going out and um, looking for some content, they, uh, you know, they need to know what it means to, to search for something on Twitter or other, other free commercial platforms and so on, what it means for a site to be accessible and so on and so forth. And this is it in a snapshot. So we, we, are, we have an online course, <clears throat> which, will be, which is already there. It's gonna be available in English. It is already available in English. We are just waiting for the Spanish and Italian translations to be ready before launching it, which will happen, uh, I would say, no later than the end of the year. We plan to have some 150 certified learners that will go through the hackathons in the three universities, which all in all will produce more than 100 artifacts, products, OERs, courses, ideas, teaching strategies, course designs, anything you can imagine, maps, timelines, padlets, anything you can imagine that will all be connected into this, uh, let's say, platform, very simple connection, collection of, of artifacts, uh, which hopefully will survive the project and will, will then become the house of the many others, we hope universities that want to adopt this, uh, this approach. 
Last slide, we, are, we have been working on this for one year, and I'm happy to say that this has been uh, raising a lot of interest. Last week at the Mozilla, at the MozFest in, uh, in, uh, in the UK, we presented this, and we had a lot of interest by a number of universities. We presented it at the Eden Conference uh, in Genova the, this summer, and again, we had a number of uh, interested organizations. So what's in for you in, in this work we are doing? You can help us improve in the course by adding an activity, proposing a video, proposing a practice that you are doing or saying that something is missing and we can work on that for, for you. We have one more year to, to do this. You can take the online course either as an individual, as a teacher or as a, as a university. So ideally we are talking to people responsible for teacher training and we are asking them to to, to embed this course in their offer. So, and then you can use the content the way you want. You can organize a hackathon, some mini workshops like they will be doing, for example, it seems in Luxembourg University, you can really tailor it your, your own way. The only thing we, we would like to happen is for this to be, not to be replicated in the classic courses for teacher training in, in ICT, but really to be as open, active and collaborative as possible. You can organize a, a, an edu hackathon. We are developing a, a mini manual for you to start thinking on how, what this would look like in your institution, to do some design thinking and to really design it together with your colleagues. And we would love to see a few more edu hackathons happening in Europe during the lifetime of this project. And of course, you can join the community becoming part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this exercise. That is the website, eduhack.eu. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, the, the invitation is open to everybody to just come there, let, your, let us your, your data, and we will be in touch with you to see how we can work with you on this to, to actually to change a bit, but substantially and hopefully meaningfully the way we are, we are, we are um, building digital literacy capacity in our teaching population. I'm ready for questions. Uh, can I, uh, Mark, can I take questions the way I see them? Or That's wonderful. You... Thank you, Fabio. I oh. believe you've certainly lived up to the, the theme of this uh, this event. I wonder if everyone, it's quite difficult to show appreciation in Adobe Connect. I wonder if everyone could just type the word clap in the chat box uh, just to show Fabio the, the appreciation we have for the presentation he's put together for us. Wonderful. Thank you. See the applause coming through there. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very. This so, is, are there any questions? <laughs> if there are any questions, could you please type them in the chat box as well? I'll, I'll keep an eye out for them as the. I see. I, comes I see a question by Kaspar about the technology behind the course. If that is open source as well, yes. So the the, the technology, let's say, where the content is sitting is just a WordPress site, so it's totally open, and uh, that is pure HTML pages, very simple. And then uh, in order to, let's say, the, the, this platform, I think is built in Ghost, if I remember well, that is another publishing system that allows to have mini blogs, simpler blogs than what WordPress can give you for the teachers, and then will allow to get from the blogs of the platforms and also from other blogs of teachers, all the posts related to the course and to present uh, them to the to the let's say the, the other the other learners. But basically, the technology of the course itself is not that important. What is I think most important is that we are trying to really point teachers to as many other technologies and tools as possible. We know it's not so nice to ask people to register everywhere or in many places, but we really don't care. I think uh, teachers should be able to be let's say, uh, allowed to experiment, to register somewhere, to, you know, to, to like the thing the, that the tool is doing or not to. And of course, when we find, like in Wikipedia, things like the Wikipedia adventure that can really bring you through a, through a solution, it's something that we do. But in other cases, we simply uh, propose some activities where teachers can experiment with a specific tool, like time maps uh, and stuff like that. And for the moment, we have been testing this with some 20 teachers, if I remember well, uh, within the universities, the three universities. And I have to say, they like the, this approach, let's say, this uh, quite daring approach. Excellent. I'd... Are there any other questions coming through? We do have some time for more questions. Um, 
we can um, email them to Fabio later. To also, questions by, by the fellow speakers. So if you want, I'd be interested in knowing what you think. There's another question from Casper there. Do you validate the OER resources? Is there a kind of quality control? Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> we have been, in my opinion, we have been overly validating this internally in the sense that uh, we have been producing the, the, the content mainly by using existing OER. So let's say we have been structuring the curriculum in a rather original way. We have been inspired by, by Edinburgh University in terms of structure by the 23 Things course. I don't know if you know it. It's really nice, called 23 Things. Something similar, very, I would say, destructured uh, approach towards the digital literacy. From and so we started from there as a, as an approach, but and then we validated uh, um, the quality of the resources internally with uh, um, instructional designers, and we are just we have just finished this. Not only in terms of the quality, but also in terms of the adaptation of of the course to the context of Italy and Spain, because we're doing this in three countries. So the, the hardest part has been when you have to find a video in Spanish that can substitute a video in English, which is so good, and the video in Spanish is not as good as the other one. What do you do? So in that case, you use uh, you know, YouTube subtitles. It's quite easy. But when it's a tool that does not have the, the Spanish version, what do you do? So we, we, have, we have been into evaluating this quite a lot. And we are going to open. And at the moment, we are also uh, evaluating this, uh, the, the content with real real teachers. We have some five teachers per university that are looking at, looking at this. And we are going to open this up to the, I would say, the community also for evaluation. We, I just discovered that WordPress has a very nice system that you can, where you can just click somewhere in the, on the screen and put a comment there. So people are commenting on the screen wherever they want. And this is... Uh, is working, so we are getting some ideas, especially some um, some holes. People are saying, why don't you use also this tool? Why don't you talk about gaming? Why don't you talk about uh, MOOCs? We don't talk about MOOCs, for example, with this name by by choice, but we will have to because people want that. So um, at a certain point, some MOOC activities will come out. That sounds like some important challenges. There's another question from Simon, but Fabio, I'm wondering if you could answer that one by chat, uh, just so that we can move on to our next speaker. I can do that. Is that okay? I can do that, sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Fabio. Very inspirational uh, presentation. Great to see some innovation uh, working well, especially across languages. So very well done to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, hand over now to Dr. Jean-Claude Callens, who is coordinator of the Distance Education Program in Vivas. Uh, the focus of his talk is the challenge to reduce dropout in distance education uh, through making evaluation place and time more flexible. So, Dr. Jean-Claude Callens, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, I suppose you hear me well. You do hear me. Yeah, you're too clearly. Sorry, I turned okay, on my microphone. Okay, 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 thank you. So, uh, I put the screen. So, uh, as we want to, to be on the same page, uh, I will start with, with a brief. Uh, introduction of the research that we have done in Vives, then so some results of the research and I will conclude with a summary. So we started in Vives uh, with our distance education in 1997 and we, we started in the teacher education program. Uh, we have only seven students. Now today, 20 years later, uh, we have 30 programs and we, we have around uh, 2,300 students. Uh, we have five areas. Uh, we have commercial science, healthcare, applied social uh, studies, education, and biotechnology. So to put, to put something in perspective, uh, the 2,300 students that follow a program through distance education, it takes about 15% of the total of the VIVA student population. So for us, the distance education programs are rather important. Uh, however, uh, we see that only a small number of students uh, are getting their degree. Uh, so we have uh, in our distance education programs uh, a higher dropout than in the face-to-face -face programs. So, so the challenge that we have is uh, how can we reduce the dropout in distance education? In other words, how can we enhance retention? Uh, 
to find an answer to that to, to reduce the dropout uh, the, our starting point was a student profile so here you, you see a cross uh, tabulation um, here uh, you see that almost 30% uh, of our students who follow a distance education program have to combine work 50% or more with uh, the family with the care of their family so uh, they are challenged uh, to, to do their study and to combine it with work and their family to, to make it possible to combine work um, uh, care for family and study in our opinion it's necessary that they have learned control that they have measure a measure is that they have a, be able to combine work and their leisure measure so for us for us learned control uh, it, it's a very uh, strongly connected with distance education for us learned control and distance education they are like uh, laurel and hardy they're inseparable and for the Flemish uh, on the, um, among us, uh, for us, distance education and learner control are, are really like Nicole and Hugo. Uh, for the not Flemish, uh, Nicole and Hugo, they are uh, two very famous singers and songwriters in Flanders, as you can see. So, to find an answer, the, the, the focus of this research is the flexibilization of. Uh, evaluation. So, in this distance education, students have to come over to the campus uh, at fixed time. So, uh, when they have to come over at fixed time, they have less learner control. So, we try to find out uh, what, it, what the impact could be uh, if students can choose the moment that they take their evaluation and what the impact could be if they take exams remotely, for instance, at home. So in summary, uh, our research is about uh, the challenge to reduce uh, the dropout through uh, enhance the learner control by the flexibilization of evaluation place and time. Uh, we do this by two elements uh, we have done some literature analysis and some analysis of the data uh, it looked like a dog we thought and it walks like a dog quacks like a dog it is a dog so what does research say about uh, learner control first uh, there has been a lot of research on learner control there are several results I only mentions two. The first one, it, I, I have, we have chosen the, these two because for us they are uh, the most important one. First, uh, it seems that uh, learner control works if there is enough structure. Uh, students has to know uh, how, whom, with whom, and when they can communicate with their professors. Uh, they have to know where and when. Uh, exams are, are taken etc etc there has to be a clear structure to give learner control to students that's the first one that we take the second one is it seems that learner control works that it has an impact on the student results if the student has enough prior knowledge without prior knowledge it seems that uh, learner control works less Secondly, some data analysis. Uh, we have done, we have the focus on two things, the flexibilization of time, just when the students can choose when they take their exam. And secondly, we focus on the flexibilization of place. For instance, they take their exam at home and uh, the proctoring uh, happens uh, through their uh, computer. Uh, the flexibility of time uh, in our distance education programs the students take their exam in what we call an exam center so they have to uh, subscribe uh, online uh, when they have to when they will take their exam at the exam center 
So we have all the data of the students when they have taken their exams. And we have also have all data from the Turkey programs that we have in distance education, uh, where stu when students are able to take uh, their exams. Uh, you have to know that in our Turkey programs, some programs are very flexible. In those programs, uh, students can choose whenever to, uh, they take their exam. In other programs, they are less flexible and they have fixed times when, uh, from which students can choose when they take their exams. So we put all the data together and what we see was um, that uh, the programs where students have more flexibility to take to choose the time to take the exam, in those uh, programs the students have significantly uh, better results than the programs where they have less flexibility uh, of their organization of exams. Second, uh, we have looked at some uh, student characteristics and what we see was if students are further developed in the program, when they are almost ready to graduate, and those students uh, have better uh, take more benefits of the learning or of the flexibilization than students who are just started their program. Is it again? It seems that prior knowledge has impact on the uh, on on the learning content. Secondly, I uh, shortly uh, get on the flexibilization of place. The challenge is how can we uh, support students to take their written exams remotely? It's not in the exam center, uh, remotely. Uh, we have first done some uh, systematic search on literature. And we only find, here you can see how we, we, we done that uh, search. Uh, based on that search, we only selected two articles. The first, oh, here we are. And the first is, uh, in summarizing, uh, said that, oh, there is only little information available about unproctic internet testing. So there are not much uh, studies about uh, testing remotely. And secondly, studies who uh, mentioned in the this, in this study of Levens and Berg, said that there is a low significant difference between proctored and unproctored internet testing. Uh, the results of the second study, so uh, in summarizing four uh, elements, it seems that the student perceptions about uh, the implementation has an impact. Secondly, um, it seems that the assessments that are used are often, often are poorly designed. Third, uh, there was a warning that uh, the use of new forms of educational technology may lead to further excluding of uh, uh, some already social excluded. Finally, uh, it seems that the feedback after an assessment is really important. So in Vivas, uh, we use a, a, a tool to organize uh, our exams remotely, and it's called Proctor Exam. And uh, if you want more information, you can see the link there, uh, where you find a, a brief uh, information about how Proctor Exams work. And, and I'll give you a short uh, description. When a student takes his exam at home, uh, he has to take an exam on his computer. And we use the webcam, uh, we share the screen, and uh, we, we also uh, film with, our, with, a, uh, an iPhone, with a smartphone. So we have actually three angles. So we have the screen sharing, we have the webcam, and we have a, 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 a third uh, source, and that's the the mobile phone. So we really can proctor in what the student is doing at home um, to see if all is, if is not wrong. 
So what we have done in this research, uh, when we started the program of taking the exams remotely, uh, there were only a small number of students that take their exams remotely. We started uh, about three years ago, and in the first days there were uh, around uh, 40, 50 students who take their exams remotely. Uh, at this day, uh, I checked it, uh, I take the numbers here, um, last year there were 1,474 uh, exams who were taken remotely. That's about 10% of all the exams in a distance education program are taken remotely and not in our, in our, in our exam center. So we have taken, when we started the program, uh, uh, we have taken a, a survey from our students and there were 37 students who participated in that uh, survey. And here you see some uh, results of that, uh, of that, uh, of that survey. Uh, most important is uh, this study, of course, has to be considered as a very explorative study. There were only 37 participants and were only uh, ask for their opinion because uh, we're only measuring their perceptions so it is very explorative however when we go into the comments that students gave almost all students uh, who, that, who participate in that survey said they will take their uh, exams remotely again although they had experienced uh, some uh, stress uh, by doing the exam at home so this is uh, my last seven, uh, slide uh, I summarize so the, the the main topic of this research was how can we reduce dropout and distance education the focus was uh, well we can look at the organization of our uh, evaluation and we do see that more flexibility of the organization of ex exams lead to better results but we have to support students with less prior knowledge again these results that i mentioned are really very explorative but they do give uh, an idea for further more grounded uh, results so i would thank you and the, who has to be if someone is interested sorry uh, this is my email address you always uh, can send me an email if there are any questions please that's wonderful thank you Jean Claude there are a few questions that are coming through uh, I wonder though if we could just show the same uh, clap appreciation that we did for Fabio earlier uh, for a wonderful presentation showing uh, quite an ambitious innovative approach to exams so, uh, Jean-Claude, there are some questions that came through uh, from Monica uh, Hermanescu. How can you be sure that your online student is taking your exam and not another person? Oh, well, we're, we're filming. Uh, so we have the webcam. Uh, they have shown their idea, uh, their, their, their idea when they start the exam. So we can really check if the person who takes the exam is really the student uh, that we said he is. Uh, and we were recording all the, the time uh, when he's taking his exam. Great. Have you come across any instances of cheating yet? Yes, we have. Um, um, most of the time, uh, not cheating, but we do have some discussions with students. For instance, that there was a, a, an online uh, so we're working online. This is what, when there was a small break uh, in the internet access, uh, we do check if there was, uh, during that time, uh, if there was fraud or not. So at this moment, what we see is that there are less frauds, almost none, in comparing with uh, the exam center. So the student, we, we think that it has to do with the fact that the student knows that he's been filmed. Mm. So. He has to be. Uh, he, he knows he's been filmed. So, so students uh, are more cautious. We have we have some issues, but less than uh, in the exam center. Right. There's another question from Lucas Zaskis. Uh, have you noticed any 
coloration between three-angle video or any proctored exam, and students' stress levels, which could impact their results during the examination? Uh, no, we, we didn't have uh, done that at, at this moment. We just ask at this moment uh, how they perceive uh, taking exams remotely, and uh, but we, did, we did not uh, further research on that. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's an interesting topic, yes. Uh, another question coming through from uh, Zakaya Dogan. Apologies if I haven't pronounced your name right. Is there a statistics um, dropout ratio of before and after the intervention? Um, I'm just thinking now. Uh, uh, no, we, we don't have it. Uh, this is, uh, it, it would be interesting to have those. Uh, but we have only started uh, the recording uh, uh, when we if, um, we have started the exam center just three years ago. So so we we are able to gathering the data uh, just three years ago. Uh, three years ago was also the moment that we start with a, a more flexibilization of our program. So we could not compare to. Uh, Earlier periods, but we do, do can pre, uh, compare between programs that are less flexible and uh, more flexible. Mm -hmm. And the most flexible uh, programs seem to, to gather better results than the less flexible. We've got time for probably one more question, but there are some others you might answer for us by chat. Um, one asked by Mahmoud Hawamde, who I think uh, has asked a question on most of our minds How can we get this research? Is there anything published we can pick up on? And, and read later. Uh, yes, uh, the, there is a, a publication uh, of this, but I don't have the title here now with me. Uh, but we, we have done some publications uh, on uh, this issue, um, but I don't have the, the title here at, at this moment. Would it be possible to perhaps um, copy and paste some of those and put them in the chat box so that um, some of the audience can pick up on that? Okay, I will. Very, very interesting. Okay, I will. Very interesting Thank work. You. Thank you, Jean-Claude. There is a question too from Simon, uh, but perhaps again you could answer that one through the chat. Uh, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, I will. Thank Lovely. You. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, very innovative work. Uh, very interesting. I think a lot of distance universities are looking to do the sort of thing you're doing, uh, but it certainly takes a lot of courage to go first. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Right, let's uh, turn now to Simon Paul Atkinson, who is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, uh, MA. P-G-E-C-L-T-H-E, -E, uh, educator, researcher, developer, consultant, uh, and the title of his presentation is Designing Pathways, Which Way to Innovation? Now, Simon has worked in online and distance education since 2001, holding senior educational development roles in the United Kingdom and also New Zealand. Uh, the focus of his research has been the development of visual representations of learning designs to assist course developers. And he'll be joining the learning design team at the Open Polytechnic in New Zealand in December. And Simon, I just want to qu add quickly, I'm looking forward to working with you because, of course, uh, I'll be joining you in February of next year. Great. Indeed. So, Simon, Simon, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you. Um, we are we have had some technical issues, so I'm going to start talking before you can possibly see something. I can't see anything on my screen at the moment. Um, I know we are. We had uploaded my presentation as a PDF, but I'm, I can talk without slides if necessary. It just means you're going to have to focus on me at the top, uh, and I'll try and be as animated as possible while we see if the, the presentation can catch up. Um, thank you very much. I, it's really interesting, actually, to hear colleagues, particularly from different European perspectives, um, and certainly some of the work that's, that's happening uh, between uh, countries, between language, between languages. Um, and the danger of coming third in such a setting is that things that have already been said uh, kind of slightly undermine some of the things I'm advocating, or possibly I'm going to see if I can strengthen the things that have been said um, already. So I'm going to try and turn it around. Um, particularly, I want to pick up on two, two issues which I'm going to follow on through when I think about innovation in terms of designing pathways. One is the social context, which Jean-Claude talked about. The, the blending of leisure and work. I think social context is very important in everything that we design for distance learning, not least because the learners are generally not in front of us and they are in their social context when they study. Um, and also I want to pick up on some of Fabio's uh, 
comments about the very interesting modeling that goes on in the edu um, hackathons we've had a private side conversation about some of the the value in video recording some of those group interactions um, for future research but i just wanted to, to to i want to really tackle the issue as to whether or not at a kind of philosophical level if you like we are in danger sometimes of looking for technical solutions rather than trying to put the learning design focus very much on the learner. Um, so again, uh, my question to Jean-Claude then at the end, which was, you know, do, do, you, do you find it overly restrictive in terms of the models of examinations that are possible, given that you then have a technological um, constraint? So those are the kinds of issues that I just want to talk about. And I'm going to start by, uh, I want to start by thinking about this in terms of, a, of an analogy, which is basically that what we do effectively is kind of um, drawing maps for our learners. We, it's a little bit like navigating a map. We produce content, um, we, we map, we, do, uh, we produce roadmaps effectively through our content, and we then produce assessment as stops along the way, uh, if you like. And I think that's quite a useful analogy. The, the travel analogy is quite common in education, but I think when we think about who we are designing learning for and who controls the journey, it's useful to kind of keep that cartographic um, analogy in mind. Some of the things that we've talked about already today is, uh, are the differences between whether or not students are studying as part of cohorts or whether they are studying as individuals. Um, as to extend my analogy, and I'm gonna flog this analogy to death, by the way, um, is that, um, you can think about cohorts as taking a bus on a particular journey, stopping exactly at the same time, taking exams at the same time, or driving a car, having a solo journey and stopping whenever you like. Um, and clearly that bo both of those present very different technological challenges, but more importantly, very different design challenges as well. I think sometimes we overexpect our technology innovation. We, we anticipate that we are making much more progress simply because the screens look different. Our, what our students look at, see every day looks a little bit different and that's an innovation in and of itself. We go from this VLE to this uh, open source application and we can get a bit carried away sometimes in thinking that that in and of itself is an innovation. I think arguably there hasn't been a great deal of innovation in terms of truly um, learning modes, really, other than the interruption of technology. So we've gone from classrooms to remote access, printed materials to digital materials, physical media to the virtual experience, but we haven't really changed as much as perhaps we sometimes think we have. And I would question whether or not a lot of the forms of learning are really new forms. There's been a very interesting discussion online in the UK recently about people asking for alternative pedagogies. And um, my interaction was simply to say, what for alternative for who? Uh, um, and university might change platforms. That's an alternative met methodology for delivery. It doesn't necessarily change any of the underlying pedagogy itself. Um, we can argue at a different point about the distinction between pedagogy and andragogy and hortagogy and other things, but in terms of the learning delivery, um, that technology is not always particularly uh, refreshing any of those other underlying me me messages. So we've seen in the last 20 years, um, 25 years, that we've got new lexicon, we've got new words that we use when we talk about learning. We talk about syn synchronous and asynchronous learning. We talk about blended, flexible, distance, open, um, online. But arguably, uh, I would argue what we're really doing is very often is we are simply taking existing practice and we are effectively um, transmitting it into our own environments. And I'm as guilty as anybody of doing that. Um, I basically, I went back in uh, 2001 when I worked at the Open University, um, I did some what I thought was very innovative work in providing a visual metaphor, visual interface for an, a, an online discussion forum where people could drop their comment within a particular visual graphical interface rather than in a list. 
um, I was positing that you might want to have a discussion forum alongside a document just by using iframes. So when you change pages, you'd get a new discussion forum against each bit of text. Now, the technology has moved on significantly since then, um, but the underlying message hasn't really changed particularly in, in the last um, 20 years. We're still doing the same thing, we're just doing it in a slightly different way. I think a lot of us were very enthusiastic when Second Life came along because we thought this is a completely new experience for most students. Apart from the connectivity issue, most universities logged on and built entire campuses. Um, I visited any number of empty lecture theatres and wandered around virtual campuses in Second Life um, because the, the programming was actually quite intricate to try and do anything really very immersive was actually very very difficult so it was much easier to just basically take the same visual metaphor and reproduce it so that was something of a disappointment um, I think there have been some fairly innovative technologies I'm not against technology I am an educational technologist at heart and an academic developer but I think um, I would advocate something like VoiceThread which some of you will be aware of I'm sure which is basically a, a discussion forum that is in effect a virtual environment. You can contrib contribute by audio, video, or text annotation. Um, and you can see that's illustrated on the screen there. And you can embed that in various virtual learning environments. Certainly some of the experiments that I've done in teaching postgraduates, um, it's, it's, it's enabled them to respond in a much richer way, in a more immediate way than composing a well thought out um, written text piece. So I think it. I think it. Um, I think it's very important to try and work out whether or not you you are really just establishing the root and the mode, and even if it's something like a micro credit MOOC, all one all we are often doing is literally just laying a pathway through um, individuals and laying a groundwork for them as to where we think they where we think they should go and i think real innovation comes when we focus away from us to them so picking up on the two um, previous comments i think um, certainly um, jean claude I I talking about sort of the ability for students to make choices as they go um, fabio's comments um, about getting faculty to brainstorm and work together there is a danger that we still think about innovation based on what we do for them rather than what we ask them to do and i would argue that if we try and get to focus on getting students to agree their own destination set their own outcomes with agreed awards to determine a personal pathway um, and how they're going to evidence those outcomes and then choose how best to evidence those agreed outcomes. Fabio made a comment in his presentation to say, talking about assessment, saying hopefully a portfolio. Um, and I think portfolios are almost certainly going to become the emerging form of um, the, the dominant form of assessment for any kind of independent, flexible learning mode just because it then releases you in terms of the same sort of timetabling of exams and, and so on. So I think we shouldn't really be thinking about tweaking their mode of travel, giving them a new car to drive. We want to be thinking more about the, the, the way in which they are um, envisaging the journey and helping them to plan that journey ahead of themselves. We, we recognize learners are individuals. They live in a social and professional context. That's already been picked up on. Um, certainly by what Jean-Claude said, and I think that's really very, very, very important, not least because we want to, as we increasingly teach internationally, we have to accept that students come with very, very different epistemological notions, a lot of different cultural contexts that lay themselves very differently to their engagement. That requires us, of course, to lose a little bit of control if we focus on the technology, we then start worrying about how we're going to deliver that technology, how we mandate, how we make sure that it is the same individual, the, the question about whether you can check that the person sitting the exam is the person, that then becomes something of an obsession. And I think we then take some of the power away from the student. So my suggestion is that we really should be thinking about uh, models in which we can negotiate outcomes with students. This is the distinction between formal and non-formal learning. We can talk about some of the UNESCO definitions later, perhaps, um, at the end. But I think 
arguably what we really want students to do is be defining some of their own intended learning outcomes. Now that requires us as institutions to be incredibly flexible in how we're going to validate and accredit and recognize those outcomes. And that's the real challenge. That's the body of work I think we should be doing as institutions, rather than trying to prepare multitude of courses to fit, to fit every particular individual. If we let the individual decide how they want to learn, how they want to evidence, um, and our job is then to do whatever we can in order to assure that learning has happened. So negotiating the measurements of success is a very big um, part of it. What I'm very keen on, given the work that I've done um, in the UK around some of the um, access to education, a project called the POISE project, which was very much about trying to get faculty to have a conversation with students at the very beginning of their studies, what their epistemological ideas are, what their frame of reference is. And I think one of the things we often um, neglect, which again reinforces what Jean-Claude said, is we often neglect to recognize that they are, all our learners are situated and are surrounded by in-place resources. Bringing a student from a context to learn something away from that context and to learn that in our environment, no matter how rich it is, is still an abstract model of learning. And we need to be putting as much of the, the learning back into the student context. I don't think that's as hard as it might sound given that you know, we've got graduate profiles, we've got competency standards from most professional programs, we want to ensure that there is a broad um, provision. And so I suggest all five domains of learning, um, and I can talk about those a bit later, um, but cognitive, metacognitive, the affective, psychomotor and interpersonal domains, all of those domains of learning should be present in every study program that any student ever engages in. I think having a broader perspective on assessment, I would be very nervous about doing set, set exams in a flexible online open distance context. So trying to work out how you get patchwork, how you design patchwork and portfolio assessment to track the student to make sure it is the same student that's producing each piece of work basically by making it so heavily contextualized for that student. There's no way that they can get an essay farm to write an assignment for, for them, for example. Um, and really to try and get them to contribute as much of their local situated in place resources um, as possible. Now, all of those things do take require us to have a shift in terms of some of the way that we provide our structured learning for, univers for students. Um, and I think that is a major challenge. But I think rather than trying to tweak the map, we need to basically recognize that the real innovation, I believe, is in the learning design process itself. Um, and I was very intrigued by some of the comments that Fabio was making about the, the value of bringing people together to design things. I agree entirely. So I'm suggesting again that running design workshops is absolutely the way to design learning. There's no question you should never leave an academic to go away and design learning on their own. It always has to be a collaborative effort. Um, and you follow a particular model. Um, the, the model I follow is an eight stage learning design framework, but I think the crucial thing for me is to focus on making sure that you develop profiles of students and that everything is then based around fulfilling those learning objectives for those particular students. So my takeaway from the session um, today, which I hope um, will at least stimulate some discussion later, perhaps at the end of the fourth presentation, is not to look to technology for the innovation solutions. I think building on what Jean-Claude and Fabio have already said, I think it's very important that we explore students' life contexts and that we design the learning to try and leverage that, to exploit that um, wherever we can. So I think that's me done, Mark. Um, I'm not sure how my timing went. I should have done that in less than 10 minutes. That was my plan. Oh, it's 11 minutes. Provide the applause Please. to you. It's the applause coming through now. It's wonderful. So, Simon, during your presentation, there were a few comments made. Uh, let me just pick up on one of them from Ken Curry, who comments, surely, sorry, Ken, surely it is also important to ensure that the student journey visits particular places, uh, for example, key concepts. Uh, imagine driving through Europe and missing out on Vienna or Venice. Uh, ever a, a comment?
So, uh, certainly, yeah, no, that, that's an interesting point. And I think obviously anything that's a key concept would have, be, would have already been agreed as an intended learning outcome. I think there's there's a difference about the, the way I write the way I write outcomes. I very often write what appears for some of my colleagues to be too many outcomes, because I think it's important to define the skills rather than the content. So arguably, if if for example in that example, if you're saying to the student you want to explore, you want them to understand the the, the chronological pattern of development in Renaissance architecture, visit two or three Italian cities en route. That's different from articulating that you want them to visit Venice. So Venice is the, the content provision. The, the explore Renaissance architecture is the concept itself. So I think that's where we get into really interesting arguments with colleagues in a design setting is getting them to distinguish between the concepts and the content that they're used to delivering. An important challenge you gave us. Innovation means letting go of control. Uh, wonderful. There's a um, other question coming yeah. through. Yes, great. You can take it. I've got a question. I've got a question now from Arena. If learning outcomes ideally may be negotiated with the students, they cannot be fixed in curriculum, which goes under quality assurance peer reviewing, or their definition may not be measurable. How do you deal with that? Again, I think I think there is certainly a need for our quality assurance mechanisms and indeed any external validation system to be possibly pushed. The boundaries of that are um, need to be negotiated. We're seeing some of that going on in the UK at the moment where we have apprenticeships for professional accreditation and yet the internal, the models of, of how students identify what academic credit they get in order to meet those um, competency frameworks might vary from one individual to another depending on their context. But yes, you're absolutely right. That's a major institutional challenge. I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that we can solve it immediately. Um, I, would, I would like to think that most of our quality assurance colleagues um, are really looking themselves to try and find ways of enhancing the quality of the learning experience. And having all the students um, experiencing exactly the same learning is not necessarily providing what the students actually need, would be my argument. When we talk about learner profile, then we come back to the point that profile may vary in a large scale from housewives to tech junkie teenager. How can we overcome that situation while we're designing our curriculum? So that's a really, really interesting question. I think again, when you when you sit down when you sit down with a design group, um, I'm, I've experienced this at the Open University working with course teams, but but more lately um, in another university, when you sit down with a team and you identify. The reality is that most students tend to group into three or four broad categories. Um, and then what you're doing then is providing the flexibility by enabling them to support a dialogue with you about designing outcomes and, and giving them the opportunity to provide in situ or in place contextual um, assessment evidence. You're allowing them to then make those individual adjustments. So I don't actually see that necessarily the housewife and the tech junkie might necessarily have very actually very, they might not actually define their outcomes very, very differently. If, if, on the other hand, you have an outcome that requires an individual to produce, say, a digital media object, and the inference in your question might be that the housewife is less able to do that, clearly there is a degree of supplemental learning that has to happen around that learner's experience. I think in reality, that happens a lot now. But we don't necessarily acknowledge it. Students are in are railroaded to, to follow a process. Whatever additional learning they might have to do, think about international students who might be learning in a different language to their native tongue. Um, that's not often credited. And I suspect that really it should be. They should be able to present some of that additional supplemental learning into their portfolio of evidence towards to the, the, the award. We need to move on now to uh, Dr. Estella Dolcini, who's standing by. <laughs> so there's still a few um, items coming through in chat, and so I I'm was to trying to some of those in the background as uh, Estella presents. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Estella Dolcen. She's a teacher researcher at Innovative Studies Institute at the Tautas Magnus University in Lithuania, and she's also the president of the Lithuanian Association of Distance and E-Learning. So the topic of her doctoral dissertation in education 
focused on virtual mobility in higher education. So today she'll be presenting the student challenges while participating in virtual mobility gathered from different virtual mobility cases. Estella, thank you for joining us and we look forward to what you have to say to us. Okay, hello everyone. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me well. And I'm trying to share my screen so you can see my presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the last slide. So uh, I'm really glad to, uh, to participate in this event and to listen to the three former presenters who actually guided us through the way of student and focusing on student learning as my presentation is also focusing more on the student from the student's point of view. And I would like to keep uh, the last uh, idea from the Simon's presentation when he stressed that uh, one of the um, proposals could be to st uh, to make use of the student uh, uh, local resources they have at their own institutions and their background and to continue uh, to have a look at this from the virtual mobility um, perspective. Why I'm talking about it, first of all, uh, that uh, in our university, Vitotas Magnus University, we have been doing virtual mobility since 2009. So it's uh, almost 10 years uh, now. And uh, it is, we have done a lot of research and have gained some experience. And we can discuss different cases from different perspectives. But focusing on students, that's a bit uh, nice and uh, also um, I think it's what we teachers should do. And first of all, before focusing on the presentation, I would like to start uh, from the how we describe what is virtual mobility. Okay, because sometimes people say that it is uh, any course that you can do online, it is virtual mobility course, but to be more precise in higher education, I should say that uh, what is the difference between regular distance learning course and virtual mobility course? And from our perspective, when how we define and understand is that in virtual mobility course, you focus more on international activities, on international competence development of either students or teachers or the, the ones who are your main target group. Of course, uh, you involve here higher education institutions and base everything on uh, um, agreements between institutions. Uh, and I'll tell you later why it is important. Uh, of course, in today, uh, virtual mobility in the most popular language is English. I understand that the bigger nations have possibilities to do virtual mobility between other countries as well. But in Europe, I think it's English the most common language. Also, uh, uh, the content of the course is usually accessible in virtual learning environment and the communication and collaboration of for students and teachers are ensured by the use of technology. But the main stress is, and the main difference of the virtual mobility course from regular distance learning course is this international aspect that comes into mind. Okay, and um, why do, you, from our perspective, usually students, what, why they participate and what are the main benefits? Of course, if you are able to travel across the Europe and experience different learning modes in different universities, you are glad to do that, but not every student can do that. So participating in a virtual mobility course or a course in another institution's in virtual mobility mode, you not only experience the different learning modes of that institution, but also you get a wider approach and wider perspective from the content that is delivered by this institution. And also, of course, you can benefit from improvement of virtual mobility competences, such as linguistic competence, uh, cultural, intercultural, ICT competence, of course, learning outcome related competence, and personal or social competences. Also, uh, if in physical mobility you come to, you are able to come usually to one institution during one semester in virtual mobility, that's 
uh, easy for you to study in two or three even different institutions at the same semester. And what students usually think of that this opportunity enhances their employability and career opportunities. And the main idea or the main additional value that comes from this uh, virtual mobility course is uh, this different perspectives of different learners in the subject. And as uh, experts who have done this course say that uh, when you're choosing, you as a teacher choose a subject for virtual mobility course, you should think of the course that is interesting to be seen from different countries' perspective, where these cultural differences really bring the value and differences and enrich each participant in the course. And this not only allows you as a participant to share your national approach, but to experience from this different nationalities and different uh, approaches from the team in, in your course. And also even uh, uh, if, what teachers usually say, if the course is repeated, uh, uh, this, the same course repeated, uh, next semester, it never will be the same because the students are not the same in the course. And these different combinations of different nationalities is what usually enriches the main in the virtual mobility course. And from our research or experience, what are the main expectations? Why do usually students join these courses? Uh, is uh, the main driving uh, feature is the recognition if the course will be recognized and if it will be promised for the students that the course will be recognized at the home institution, uh, they will definitely want to do this. If it is suggested as an open course where you can choose, but we are not sure if this will be recognized somewhere in your even home institution curriculum. This is not such a, a strong motivating point for the students. Also, we experienced that if uh, the topic is good and attractive, this is also one of the motivating factors for the students. If you promise something new that is not commonly delivered at your university, this would attract the students to learn. And usually they won't go for physical Erasmus just due to hear one course or to hear one lecture, but if you suggest it in virtual mode, that's really what they will go for. And also uh, why usually students see this as a, as a valuable experience, they also um, think that this course will be appreciated in their career by their potential employers. And so what are these the main challenges students face in this virtual mobility courses? Uh, uh, I took here experience from six different cases that were in, in a way similar, but also different cases. But uh, these uh, challenges were seen in most of the cases. So uh, the, the, first of all, the challenges for the students, this different institution. When you have a possibility to come to institution, you have some adaptation time. And when you are learning at this institution only, only virtually, it is really a challenge for you because you don't have a person you can uh, consult with. It's, uh, is it, it's very valuable if your friends are also studying at the same university. But if it, only you are alone, it's really a challenge for you because uh, uh, usually these courses are run in, during different, by different lectures. It's not always that uh, uh, you understand how these lectures uh, speak. It's not always how they deliver, what are the methods. If you're used to your u home university delivery mode, this virtual mobility possibility gives you experience different learning modes by different teachers. But that's also challenging for the students, and especially uh, for the students who come from traditional universities, who studied traditional studies and not the online studies. Also, uh, what we have noticed that all students, no matter how good they are in English or any foreign language the course is delivered, they are afraid 
before the course starts. Because they think that others will speak English better. They are afraid if everyone will understand them. If, the, if this is really, what if the other students will speak better English and my English is not that good? But this usually is um, overcome after several weeks uh, when they see that uh, definitely not everyone speaks such perfect English or uh, even if they do speak English, they usually native language speakers of English language, they usually tolerate uh, uh, other nationality students who don't speak such good English. So uh, this is really necessary, this comfort, but it is also what we notice is the challenge for students, this language barrier. Also, uh, we notice that, or at least we promote that, the main um, intercultural uh, competence development reveals in the group of, of students when they work in international teams. So uh, they get to know how differently other persons learn, how other nationalities, uh, uh, when they learn, is it an evening or a morning or whenever. And this time difference, of course, is a challenge for the students to collaborate. But when they have at least one assignment in the course that is um, to be done by uh, different nationality students, that is really, first of all, challenging, but also very much valued by students. And of course, if there is a group work, online group work, and some students are still passive, that is really a challenge for this group to come along with the different possibilities how to organize their work. Also, uh, we noticed for uh, that sector when we had one project when uh, in that sector we tried to help partners implement virtual mobility. Uh, this uh, prior technological experience and new tools are the challenges. If you suggest students the tools that they usually don't use in their daily life, they probably won't use them during virtual, mod virtual course delivery as well. And uh, if these tools are new and they don't have other tools, that is really a challenge for them to get to start using them. And in that sector, what we notice is that uh, especially if a person uh, is working and does the part-time training, uh, this finding time to get to connect and do the activities is not that much motivating because he focus more on what he's doing at the place. So these challenges and technology, uh, technology experience is really important and challenging for different kind of students. Of course, as I already mentioned, uh, that uh, prior online learning experience is very uh, good value and uh, the students who study online programs do virtual mobility courses much easier and they found them not such challenging as the students from traditional studies because uh, they are already used to online learning and uh, this uh, because it really takes time and sometimes feel students from traditional universities feel this lack of um, collaboration or at least lack of possibility to come to a teacher and to talk about the issues. And uh, of course, uh, different universities do different semesters, uh, at least have the start of the semester in different timings. And uh, it is a challenge not only for the students, but also for the teachers to start a course in September if, your, if the semester at your university starts only at the end of October. So it is a challenge for teachers to grab and to coordinate everything. This is what I, uh, we, we have been talking here about the, the importance of students' uh, uh, flexibility and choice. And in virtual mobility, what we found is a bit different. We found that if the course is not strongly coordinated, uh, it's really challenging and it's, you can really get uh, lost easily. 
So this uh, clarification and uh, strong coordination is one of the success factors that of our virtual mobility cases that we have done before. So um, it, it depends, of course, on the approach uh, you have. And what uh, we have, I would like to share while finishing to uh, with you about the testimonies, what students experience in these different cases. Of course, this open-minded, uh, this wide approach and these different skills and competences. And uh, they learn to know how to organize better their schedule time. And uh, usually, uh, although they are afraid in the beginning, what they receive at the end is more than they expected. And um, of course, they improve their English language, they improve their uh, other, other competences. And what students say that it helps them professional life, but also it helps them to find new people and new friends in these different uh, virtual courses. And uh, it is really feels like studying in a different country, although you, you are physically in your own home country. And uh, the last uh, pages with the um, students from our master studies who are delivering each year the same courses delivered for these master students, that they also share that uh, this this is unusual and unique experience and uh, as the course is focusing on social problems from different perspectives to analyze the pro problem or the same issue from different perspectives and different country resources that students have access to is uh, really important and the teachers also say that this course when the students come from different nationalities, each semester is different because you get access to different approaches and different uh, social problems. And uh, of course, you appreciate it, but it is challenging in the beginning a lot. And I would just like to finish my last slide with the invitation for you so that, that we open our universities for student and teacher virtual mobility because Offering the courses for different university students is really opening up your practices and your university as well. Thank you. Very, very good presentation uh, and very clear uh, that there are many benefits to what you've just talked about, but also some challenges. I wonder if we could just uh, quickly give Estella some chat applause, if that would be all right, everybody, just to uh, provide a, a clap in the chat area. There is a question that's come through from Simon Atkinson. Uh, what kind of approaches to orientations to learning do you think work well? So obviously you need to um, help your students to come to terms with the type of study you're talking about. How do you orientate them? Or at least what worked well. Uh, it is very useful if you have a person in each university that they call, not only in the host university or the course hosting university, but also if there is a person in each uh, university that the students come from, because it's much easier for students to come to a real person to talk if they have an issue. And we usually cooperate this with the different partner universities and lead this uh, ideas and this work for international studies departments or international relations office who usually have experience in physical mobility and virtual just it is more administrative uh, dealing but uh, the idea is similar so it is more left for international relation offices but of course it depends a lot on the teacher who is delivering the course because it is also uh, you need to welcome the students to the course. You need to in, write them more messages than you usually do in a regular course, just at least in the beginning, so, so students can know where to, where to address and when the course really started and is it already started and what to do next. So it's, it, it, uh, it asks for a lot of different approach, but 
of course, the teacher and international relations office are the main coordinators to address. So, some notes coming through in the chat. Um, it looks as though there were some connectivity problems with that presentation. I think the recording should be sound. Um, I, I did. There were a few pauses, I think, in places, but um, the, the narrative was very clear. So, for those of you who couldn't quite um, get all of the uh, presentation, if you take a look at the recording, uh, everything should be fine there. Uh, Estella, there's also a call for someone who's after your contact information, so if you could perhaps provide that in chat, uh, I, think, I think that would be appreciated. It doesn't look as though there are any more questions through there, uh, so let me wrap up. Uh, look, I think it's been a wonderful session. Uh, we've had four very, very different but very interesting examples of innovation uh, in distance education. The, the key themes that came through for me, um, I think there was certainly flexibility was a big focus, uh, a focus on the student as well and taking uh, their circumstances into account, uh, but all have been extremely innovative and helpful. Uh, so thank you to uh, Fabio, uh, to Simon, to Jean-Claude, to Estella for your time this afternoon. Do join us for upcoming events. Uh, we still have two more days celebrating European Distance Learning Week. So tomorrow there's considerations for QA of e-learning provision being hosted by Eva Ossian Olsen. And on Friday, we have a um, Eden, how Eden Network can support PhD students and research. Uh, that'll be a panel debate taking place on Friday. So I will just uh, uh, share with you the link to what we've got coming up for the rest of European Distance Learning Week. I wonder if everyone, uh, we could just provide another round of applause for all of our presenters this afternoon. And thank you for joining us. We've had around 40 participants uh, at odd stages uh, over the last hour and a half. Thanks everyone, enjoy the remainder of European Distance Learning Week. It's been a pleasure to bring this event to you.